Welcome back to the Stuff About Money podcast. I am your host, Eric Garcia, certified financial planner. And today I am joined by a new friend of mine, David Fote. David is a, a tax attorney uh, who specializes working predominantly with independent insurance agency owners and in, in, in the buying and selling of um, their practices. David is out in California, and that's a, a a commonality that David and I have is that we do work with a, a a similar client, agency owner. So I wanted to bring him on today to talk about um, the area of his practice that that he tells me he enjoys most. It is uh, the buying and selling of of practices of agencies. Um, so David, welcome to the stuff about money, man. How are you? I'm doing well, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you today. All right. So like tax attorney from California, that's really it's a really kind of thin. Uh, description of you. Tell us a little bit more. Kind of fill that out for us. Who, who, yeah. is, who is David Folk? <laughs> who is David Folk? All right. Um, so I've been doing this a little over 10 years, probably closer to 15 now. Geez, time flies as we get older. So I um, started my career working for a big tax firm, international tax firm, doing work primarily around captive insurance. So setting up those 831Bs uh, for business owners and their families and uh, helping with that successional uh, generational uh, succession planning and wealth planning for them. And then as I got tired of travel, I moved my family back to California and had the opportunity to just continue working with uh, agency owners. Um, so it's just been great, uh, probably 60 or 70 percent of my clients are agency owners here in california they allow us to specialize in certain areas of practice after you've worked for so long and and proven yourself worthy and so here with the state bar i'm a certified tax specialist so tax law tax planning um, a lot of m a work it's very tax heavy so that's where i spend a lot of my time day to day uh, with my clients so it's, it's been a great ride i really enjoyed it cool i love i love the fact that your your specialty is in the 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 tax side um of of the business because obviously there's a lot of overlap i mean there's a, there's there's a lot of overlap with what i do as a financial planner with mm -hmm. with law and estate planning and whatnot but i would say there's probably more of an overlap with with taxes so i'm, I'm really interested in, in in hearing more about that particularly in the space of of buying and selling um I'll get a lot of clients that'll come to me or people who will come to me after a sale. Hey, what can I do to, to minimize taxes? And it's like, oh my gosh, it's a little, little, little too late. We should have been thinking about that prior to, right. but we'll, we will, um, we will get into that before we hop into our topic. And, and just so people listen, the topic today is for our insurance agency owners or really anyone, if you own a business, I think this is going to be relevant to you. We just might be using language that's specific to uh, the insurance space. But we're going to talk about how to become a prepared seller of your agency. Um, insurance agencies are, are very saleable business. Even agencies that are operated poorly are incredibly saleable. And we're going to talk about how do you become more saleable? Or how do you increase the value of your um, of your agency um, before you, you you go to sell? But before we get into that, uh, I'm going to ask you: What is one thing about money you know today that you wish you would have been taught in school? I wish I would have been taught in school. Yeah. I think I think about that in context of what would I, what would today, what today, how do I say that? Today, what would I teach my kids? Mm. So yeah. my wife and I, between the two of us, we have seven, one of them, seven. 20, yeah, seven kids. Do you know, do you know uh, the average cost to raise a kid according to the USDA to age uh, I, I just know that I endure the pain every month. <laughs> I don't know what the exact number is. 300,000. Oh my goodness! So two point one million, two point one million to get your kids to age eighteen. But, uh, so I've got a twenty-year-old and one that just turned uh, eighteen, graduated, and then we still have five at the house. We'll have three kids in high school next year, and uh, one, two in junior high. So still going to keep us super busy going forward. So I think, like, what would I want to teach them? And, and one of the things is that while student loans are great student loans can really hinder opportunities later in life. And um, I, I definitely think if it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful that we live in a system where we can get loans to, to get educated, right. Just to be able to afford education, I guess is the better way to say it, but I wish I would have slowed down and I wish 
in high school, they would have taught me that it was okay to slow down. I didn't have to push through college so quickly. Could have taken my time, worked, borrowed less money. So that way I'd have more cash in my pocket today that I could put to work for myself, uh, you know, earning interest rather than paying interest on those loans. So I think that's probably one thing that I wish they would have explained to us a little bit better. Don't be in a rush. So mm, work, yeah. work while you're in school, earn some money. And then later on, you'll be able to put that money to good use working for you so that you can focus, uh, focus in your later years on things you want to be doing. Yeah, that's good. That's a, that's actually a very um, relevant conversation that we're having in my household right now. My daughter is going to be a senior. Mm -hmm. and she wants to be a, a professional dancer. So I don't understand how in, in this country, people who want to go into the arts, like their, their education is far more expensive than someone mm -hmm. who just wants to go into the, the mm -hmm. liberal arts. I don't, I don't understand that. They're, they're going to be artists that don't get paid a lot and we're going to charge <laughs> twice as much for college. But that's been a conversation of, of student debt, student loans, uh, what's an acceptable amount to graduate with, mm -hmm. um, the danger of them. Hell, I'm, I'm, I meet with 30, 40 year olds with still six figures and student loans. And, and, you know, we have to plan 800, $900,000 sometimes still going towards student loans, man. Like you said, yep. like, man, that, that could be money that could be going to other things that, that are, are, um, more, more purposeful and meaningful, but there's also that balance, right? Of like, man, I got to get educated. I want to become an mm -hmm. attorney and it is expensive. What does slowing down look like? Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So had I, had I maybe, maybe spent some time in high school getting some sort of a certificate where I could get a little bit better job mm -hmm. while I was in college, maybe that would have been a good, good Avenue. Um, or, I mean, I still worked. Don't get me wrong. I still worked all through. I worked full time during undergrad. And then during law school, worked anytime we weren't in school, I was working. And then after law school, to go on and do an LLM, which is a, a legal master's degree in tax law, that's a one year program. But I worked during the entire second semester. As soon as we got done with that first semester and I felt comfortable with the material that we were studying. I went to work. And so mm -hmm. I was working in the mornings and school at night. Um, so even still working, I came out with a significant amount of student loan debt um, that covered tuition and the extra housing expenses of having a family while going to school. Um, so I, I do think you're right. There's a balance that needs to be struck there. Um, yeah. But just letting go of that pressure of feeling like I've got to get through this now because this is what everybody else is doing. And yeah. I need to get out with a degree as quickly as possible. Um, slow down, enjoy life, take some we just, time. We just published an episode. Uh, maybe it, by the time people listen to this one, it'll be a few episodes ago about teaching kids about money. And a big part of it is just is having those conversations with them and then also modeling the behavior that we want them to model. So I love mm -hmm. how, I love how you thought through that. Your, your, your context for answering that question was what do I want my kids to learn? And I think what's really important with kids, so if you're, if you're listening and you have kids, is having conversations with kids about money. It's, it's, it's wild to me. If you stop and think about the things that our kids are hearing about money, generally speaking, from us, it's we're, we're complaining about it. We're arguing about it. We don't have enough of it. And those are the messages that we're sending to our kids. Um, and they don't always necessarily see us having the more thoughtful, critical uh, conversations or or in our own kind of world, as we're making decisions, they don't see that they're not inside of our head. They don't understand that we're making sacrifices over here to do something that we value more. And I think it's so important for parents to have those conversations more transparently with, um, with their kids. I told my wife recently, I said, like, you know, let's not tell the kids that we can't afford that anymore because we can, it's, we've decided to do something different with our money. Yeah, we can do that or we can do this. Um, so it's, it's just kind of thinking the messages that we're sending. So I, I, re I really appreciate how you put that that lens of what do I want my kids to to learn. That I think that helps clarify, um, you know, that question. All right. Well, and I I loved how you framed that too. I, I think that's super important for kids to understand. Uh, setting goals, mm, particularly yeah. in relationships with other people. Yeah. You and your spouse or, or your significant other, you set goals. And sometimes you got to sacrifice to make those goals happen. And the kids need to understand that uh, you're working towards goals. 
that's important yeah. for them. Yeah. So I, I love that. That's awesome. Speaking of goals. All right, let's hop into our topic for the day. How to become a prepared seller. It seems more and more and more um, the insurance space. It's a grind, dude. Um, you know, uh, a lot of my listeners know that I own an independent agency. I've got an incredible team, an incredible business partner that operate that that business, um, the business that I kind of grew up in. I think I was pretty much born into the insurance space. So I've, I've learned a ton about um, just insurance, operating an agency. And, the, and the, the cool thing that is that for independent agents is we have an asset that is incredibly saleable. And it just, a lot of the conversations, and maybe this is the circle of agency owners that I, that I run. And I, there, there's, there's different types of agency owners and how they think. The circle that I seem to find myself in uh, for the past for the past maybe decade or so are the guys who are operating agencies to eventually sell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they kind of see it as this is like us. This is this might be some more so than others. Like for me, this is another stock in my portfolio, in my investment portfolio. It's a little mm -hmm. bit more personal. My name's on it, but this is something that I'm building to 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 one day sell. I know that's probably a lot of the clients that you're working with. Obviously, if they're if they're mm -hmm. coming to you to sell or buy, that in their mind they're going to sell or 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 looking to to buy. Mm -hmm. An obvious statement. Um, so, what what are the things that agency owners need to be doing that you see from your perspective as an attorney to prepare themselves for a potential sale? Now, but before I kind of like press you for kind of those those items. Uh, I want to throw one out, and I apologize if this is one of yours, but I, I kind of find that it's it's maybe like the most important thing of, of any decision that we're going to make, whether I'm working with with someone on personal finances, it's it's to really understand um, the the purpose behind what you're trying to do, right? Like just to say, I want to sell, I would be like, why do you want to sell? What are you trying mm -hmm. to accomplish? Is really establishing the the end of, of what you're trying to do because at the end of the day your purpose is going to determine whether you're ultimately successful or not mm -hmm. in selling are you looking for top dollar are you looking to make sure that uh, you have a, a successor that's going to care as much about your clients as you do are you looking for a successor who's going to care about your staff as much as you do mm -hmm. all those things are going to change um you know the potential buyer that you're going to, um, you know, seek out. And I'll, 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 I'll kind of end with this and I'll kick it to you. Last year, my business partner on the financial side, my co-host, who's not here today, Xavier, um, Xavier and I sat through a, um, a, a coaching course. It was on how to become a prepared buyer. So yeah. we were, we were, we were looking at buying other investment firms. What do we need to do as a business to be prepared to buy? And that really gave me some insight into what the seller needs to do because it, it it's what am I looking for as a buyer? Um, so it's the opposite side of the coin, if you will. And one of the things coming out of that course that I realized was we're not quite in a position to buy yet because there's some other things that we need to, we need to shore up first. Hmm. And that kind of makes me think on the seller side, oh, maybe I'm not quite ready to sell yet because there are some things that I need to get in order first. So that's what you're here for as the guy who who makes some of these, um, who's brought in to help these, these deals get closed. I want to hear from you. What do we need to be doing as agency owners to be prepared to sell our businesses? Yeah, and I... So, so I do definitely agree with you. Uh, understanding why you're selling or why you're exiting is is a huge first step. Is it because you're tired of just working the grind every day, the 50 to 80 hours a week or more for, for some of these guys? Um, it takes a lot, as you know, to run a business. Um, even if you're a solo where, where you maybe have one employee or no employees, it still takes a lot uh, day to day to keep, keep that business going. So I have lots of clients who are just tired they want to be done. Uh, they want a fair purchase price. But at the end of the day, they want to just be able to not have to show up to the office. And they don't want to have to deal with the legal liability and risks that come with being the entrepreneurial business owner. Um, so I, I definitely think understanding that reasoning will help you match well with a, a, a good buyer. Because um, if, if you don't have similar goals with your buyer at the end of the day, 
it, it's going to be very difficult to get that transaction over the finish line. And there's going to be a lot of deal fatigue and deal fatigue is a real thing. Um, mm. You get in the middle of a deal and you're just, you as the seller, you're just tired. The buyer's been beating you up over due diligence items. You're trying to run your business plus meet their demands, going through quality of earnings reports and uh, financial audits of your company and having every decision you've ever made kind of nitpicked in the due diligence process. And, and what might feel very repetitive because you probably already went through a mini due diligence during your letter of intent stage as you're doing this courting before your your agreement. Now you're going through a more significant due diligence stage. And with the kind of rise of representation and warranty insurance, the the due diligence and disclosures is is I guess the the scrutiny that um is now being given to these disclosures for the representations and warranties in any deal has just increased because now you have insurance underwriters looking at everything that's disclosed. They want to know everything about your business if they're going to underwrite this policy. So, I mean, huge things. I think uh, as a seller, to be prepared, you really need to think of three categories. Okay, the, the three is going to be the, we're going to group group a bunch of little things into early preparation for your yeah. business operations. Okay. So just thinking high level business operations. The second category would be your company finances. And then the third category would be your legal compliance. And some of these will overlap naturally, right? So, so this first one is your business operations. We want to be thinking about who are the owners who are the managers and who are your advisory team? So your advisory team is going to be like your CPA, your attorneys, your financial advisors, your bankers. These are the people that you should be communicating with and coordinating with on, on your business operations, particularly if you're thinking about selling, because you, you want to know from your legal counsel, what's the best way to structure this deal. You want to know from your tax people, what can I do on the tax reporting side to help minimize um, your financial advisors? Once I have this purchase price in hand, you know, I've now got cash. What am I doing with it long term to kind of support myself and my family into retirement? Um, your bankers, just same thing. Do you have financing and debt outstanding that needs to be taken care of and paid off at the time of closing? So you, you're going to have your team together. And it might also include your your insurance people because you may need to pick up some tail coverage or mm -hmm. other insurance products. Maybe you want to look into some life insurance uh, on the side. Who knows what that might be, but you bring these people together and you coordinate with them. So you have a group of people looking out for your best interest, getting the company ready for sale. So let me ask, let me ask one question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kind of in your opening remarks, you said something that kind of stood out kind of following up on something I said. And uh, I think, I think it probably needs to be said early on in this conversation is kind of knowing why you want to sell. And you said, maybe you're just tired, right? Um, but you can't just show up one day and say, I'm tired. I want to sell tomorrow, right? So the question I would have is, as I'm preparing to sell, like, when does this preparation start? Uh, yeah, so part of that, I think it has to start today. Mm -hmm. You Every day that you show up at the office, should be a day where you're looking to grow the business in anticipation of that exit event. And what you do now will save you time and money. What you do now to prepare will save you time and money when it actually comes time to find that buyer, to sign that letter of intent, to ink that final deal document. So we wanna look at, okay, what's the ownership look like today? If you sold your company, are you going to be looking to give gifts of cash to employees, your key employees? Are you going to be looking to give gifts, gifts of cash to family members, your kids, your grandkids? You've, you've got several million dollars now. Maybe you're going to use it all for retirement, but maybe you want to make sure you're able to share some of that with other people. Well, if we're going to be making, maybe we will, it would be better for you to make gifts of some ownership of the company or to enter into some phantom equity agreements with your employees. Maybe we need to put some of the stock into a separate LLC that's uh, for the benefit of the employees where that LLC holds 
the 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 equity that your employees or your family members might benefit from. Okay. But because we did a business entity transfer instead of a cash gift, we're now able to discount the value and save you on some of the gift tax uh, reporting and obligations that you might otherwise have. So, but so we need to do that ahead of time. Yeah, let's sit here for a second. Let's sit here for a second. I think I think this is really important from a tax planning standpoint. So you're saying, if you're if you are if you are inclined to um, to reward the people who have made you successful, your staff, for example. Mm -hmm. um, what you're saying is, if that's a possible plan, then prior to sale sale, maybe you gift them some ownership into the company. Is that for a, a to reduce your taxable burden? Uh, is mm -hmm. that the same as what's the difference of doing that versus me just writing them a check after I sell? So definitely just writing them a check after you sell and treating it as a bonus. Um, that, that's a totally normal way to do it. It's deductible to the company. If you did an asset sale where the agency is the seller of the assets of the company, uh, you know, it's just a payroll expense, okay. like any other payroll expense was so deductible to you. And that's great. Um, sometimes employees like to know that they're guaranteed some sort of uh, share of the profits, either at the end of the year or, or at the sale event. And so we can accomplish that in a couple different ways. And this incentivizes those key employees, particularly producers who might otherwise be inclined to jump to another agency where we can incentivize them with some of the profits of the company. We can do it with a phantom equity agreement where it's a promise to pay. They're not getting any actual ownership. Or we could structure some type of ownership where maybe they don't have any voting rights, but they do get to participate in the, the uh, sales proceeds to some extent. And you can create small pools of ownership where we don't have to give them everything, just a, just a small little incentive. Okay. So in the, um, in the phantom agreement, that's more of, of you really don't own anything. But right. I'm just going to, I'm basically committing to giving you some money after the sale. I'm going to bonus it to you. Exactly. Expenses. Yep. In, the, in the other instance where I'm giving you some ownership, you have basis in the business possibly. Uh, when the business sells, I'm not yep. writing you a check. You're just getting money dispersed at the, at, the, at the sale based off of whatever ownership percentage you own. Yep. So okay. one one's W, the, the phantom equity is like a bonus and it's just W2 income, uh, ordinary income rates. Uh, if if they have some of actual equity of the company, however they receive it, that's going to get long term capital gains rates. Yeah. Um, I always I always caution clients about giving equity, actual equity ownership to an employee, because uh, it can be difficult to get it back if something doesn't work out. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's contracts in place to make sure you you have the ability to buy it back, but you've typically given it as a gift or reward for past performance. You don't want to have to buy it back from somebody. So the phantom equity is usually the way to go yeah. from an ownership standpoint. And again, that's more of just like a, 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 there's no, other than just having some agreement, there's nothing legal mm -hmm. that I'm doing with structure of my business, or there's no separate share classes. There's nothing like that. So it's a pretty simple, Absolutely. It's, a, it's, it's like a poor man's way of giving ownership to somebody. Right. It's, yeah. it's an unsecured promise to pay. Is what it is. So there's, if the company went out of business, there'd be no no cash to pay them. There there'd be nothing that they would be owed. Yeah, okay. um, so that's on the employee side. But sometimes people want to do some long term planning for their families, and that's usually where you'd see equity or ownership being transferred into other trusts for kids or given directly to the children if it's allowed in the state where you're living. So that kind of planning. Anytime we're actually going to move ownership of the business to somebody other than the the core people that are running it. Uh, we want to make sure we give at least a year for the shares to be held um, and let that transaction kind of season a little bit so that they can for sure claim long-term capital gains treatment um, on, on so that, the that, actual That's settlement. important, right? That's important. I want, to, I want to kind of signpost what you just said. There's a reason why we're waiting a year because mm – -hmm. Um, selling a business interest before a year is taxed at uh, ordinary income tax rates versus long-term gain rates if they hold it for longer than a year. So that, that year is not just a suggestion. That is a very wise tax planning mm -hmm. right there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 
So, so that's, that's the, when you're looking, when we're talking about preparing the business, that's on the business operation sides, ownership is one of the key uh, considerations. If I'm yeah. going to make a gift to somebody of cash, to, to a family member, particularly to a child, after I close, I've now got you know, a lot of money and I want to make a gift to a kid. Well, that gift for every dollar is taxable at the full dollar. But if I gift ownership in my business entity, I can discount that gift down to something less than a dollar. And so I'll get a gift tax savings. That'll leave me more exemption later on to transfer at death or later gifts. So I definitely think thinking about ownership and what you plan to do long term with your family uh, is important. After yeah, that, and, oh, go ahead. No, what I was going to say was what's, what's really important about this point, and we had talked about this in a previous conversation is when you're making decisions like this as a business owner, and th this is this is I think a trap for a lot of business owners is we tend to we tend to default to what's going to save me in taxes, mm. and we let that drive our decision. Where the reality should be is what decision is best in line with what I'm trying to ultimately do, mm -hmm. and what are the tax consequences of that? Because um, the last thing you want to do is give up ownership to a kid if it's really not your intention for your kid to have that money or if it's your intention to take proceeds from the business and go start something else but you need access to this capital here that, mm -hmm. you, just, that you just gifted just to somebody else so it's really being really clear on hey what's my next step right yeah, absolutely absolutely that's a great point um definitely uh and, and then once you you get that ownership piece kind of dialed in then you're looking at management the goal is to be able to turn over a business that's as turnkey as possible without you present. The better you can do that, the higher the value of your business. So having yeah. key employees, strong management team in place when you're gone, you're no longer there, is going to help give the buyer confidence that there's going to be continued growth for the company. Whatever they're buying is going to continue to grow because even though you're gone, the people that have been managing this thing and keeping it going are still there. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's key. Making sure that the right people are in the right positions. Uh, again, turnkey. You want to be able to just hand the keys over to the company, uh, so to speak, and then they can just pick it up and keep running. Um, so I think those are the three three parts of preparation of your comp getting your company ready. When we're talking about business operations, it's having that advisory team in place, okay, yeah. making sure you've got your ownership structure dialed in for your future long-term planning and making sure you've got that strong management team. So you've got turnkey operations. I had a, a professor uh, of entrepreneurship when I was at Tulane's business school. And uh, this was the, this, he was a business owner in New Orleans, like successful business owner. And he taught, he was an adjunct professor and it was the best course ever because he brought in like real life experience and just like wisdom from someone who's been at it. And I, one thing that never has, has never left my, my memory. And, and, and I still do this today. He always talks about having an advisory team. Mm. A lot of us, we're not gonna have a board of directors, but we have an advisory team. That advisory team needs to be your banker, your attorney, your CPA, your financial planner, your insurance person, and anyone mm -hmm. else. Um, maybe today it's, it could be like a, like a high level business coach, but you should have an advisory mm -hmm. team that you could pick up the phone, send a text to, call them, ask them questions, lean into them, get advice, um, bounce ideas off because we, you know, we have we have blind we have blind spots as business owners. But I love how you include that as one of your um, as one of kind of the three things for for business operations. And as as you can already tell, like a lot of this stuff is you, you got to start this up early early on in the process. So you might not even be thinking about selling today. You know, you might not have a plan to sell in 10 years, but you just never know when you're going to have to or when you're going to want to or where your circumstances mm -hmm. can change. So operating um, every day as though you could possibly be sold is is um, is w within reason, of course. Right. Well, right. I yeah. mean, you're still running the business. It's still your baby. You're growing it. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Sometimes a buyer will just show up. Somebody's looking to expand into your market. And if you're ready to sell, it could be if you're prepared to sell, meaning you've done the preparation work, then that could be a really great process for you. If you're not prepared, it's going to take some time and some money to get yourself 
yeah. uh, position correctly to to be able to move forward with that deal. And one other thing that nobody really likes to think about, I mean, we're all mortal. Things happen. We mm -hmm. get sick. We get old. Tragedies happen. Um, what kind of a position are we leaving our family in? Yeah. Have we have we really thought about um, what does the state require this for somebody to run our business? Uh, yeah. Am I in a profession that's a licensed profession? And if so, um, is it enough for my is my family going to be able to legally operate things if I'm not in the picture anymore? Do I need to put together some sort of a succession plan that provides them tools? Uh, for carrying on the business, even if they decide to sell it now that I've something's happened to me, yeah. but, but it's ready to go. It's yeah. in the condition it needs to be in and they can liquidate it as quickly as possible. Maybe a little bit harder than selling your Apple stock. But right. Still, exactly. Yeah, easy, easier. <laughs> exactly. Easier than. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. Cool. Okay. So, uh, so you, you've got that, that business operations piece, just getting your operations dialed in. But then we want to drill into two other areas, the financial side, getting yourself financially prepared and getting yourself legally prepared. When you go to sell a business, you're going to be asked to make 30 or so promises. We call those representations and warranties. And those are about the condition of the company and how you've been running things while you've been in control. They range everywhere from my business was legally formed in the state where I operate and continues to be in good standing all the way to things like uh, I took COVID money and I got all my forgivenesses. I used it how I was supposed to. And then anything in between there, uh, basically I'm in compliance with the laws. My contracts are enforceable. I didn't violate employee wage laws. Mm -hmm. you know, the typical things that you have to think about as a business owner. And there's opportunities for sellers to disclose things that might not uh, fit within the representation that they're being asked to make. And, and then you get into discussions and negotiations about how that disclosure is going to affect the purchase price. And sometimes it's as simple as we're going to hold back some money and we're going to set it aside and we're going to wait a period of time. And that period of time could be three years in some cases uh, where we want to see if anybody's going to file any suits, whether it's the government or a private individual. And so now you've got a chunk of your money sitting on the sidelines. Um, that you don't have access and control to because you're waiting to see how things shake out. So definitely, as you're looking at your financial and your legal obligations, uh, that's going to help prepare you to answer those representation and warranty. So let's talk about the financial first, because I think it's the more important of the two, really, because it's going to drive purchase price offers. And the first is just good accounting. Do you mm, have clean yeah. books? You know, what do your books look like? Um, do you have your financials prepared monthly? Which you should. Yep. Do you have your quarterly reports? Do you have your annual reports? Um, obviously, people like to delay their tax filings, and that's okay. But do you have any delinquent tax filings? I mean, you didn't, yeah. you didn't actually get filed on time. Do you owe any taxes? Um, particularly payroll taxes. Uh, mm -hmm. For some reason, I see a lot of people that seems to be a, a source of funds that they like to, uh, rather than give to the government, they like to hold on to and then just pay the penalties. Yeah, um, I don't know about that. Not not, not a good business plan. It's, Very yes. expensive loan. And you start playing with other people's money, right? Yep. You know, if you're not going to make your own quarterly estimates, that's one thing. But when you start like delaying like payroll taxes for employees or contributions for employees. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that starts getting into some 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 crazy land that you don't want <laughs> to venture yeah. into. Exactly, exactly. So having good financials, good reporting, um, that that's super key. Because the first thing that a buyer is going to want to do is they're going to review your financials. And if they're a sophisticated buyer, they're going to have uh, basically a forensic review, a quality of earnings report to look to see... Um, if you've been running things the way you should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so making sure you've got a good bookkeeper helping you, whether it's an internal person or you're outsourcing it, uh, that person is probably going to, you're going to have your biggest return on investment in your bookkeeping. So getting a solid say bookkeeper. Say that again. Say that again for me. I, I think you're going to have your biggest return on investment 
by hiring a good bookkeeper. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So by having, keeping good records, spending money on keeping good records. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's good. That's gonna be the highest return on investment. Uh, be, and because I, I, would, I would add to, to bookkeeping as well, especially if you have a large amount of agency bill type stuff. Oh yeah. Surplus man, I have clean accounting on that is, is, is priceless. It's golden. We've seen some, some pretty funky stuff. And I, I, um, we actually just outsourced that portion of our accounting, but we mm -hmm. kept it all in house until we had it dialed in. And, um, in fact, when we outsourced it recently, the, the, the bookkeeper, mm -hmm. this was, this was, this was one of those moments of like, just kind of a sense of pride that I had in kind of driving to get to where we were. And then my internal kind of operations person who just kind of like relentlessly continues to, to, to take my kind of push mm -hmm. for as close to perfection as possible. The bookkeeper told us that we were in the, probably the top 10%, if not higher of agencies that have the best records for agency bill. So I was like, Oh, that's good. Okay, cool. And that is a huge thing um, on two points. So one, insurance agencies have particular uh, accounting needs that some other just uh, goods and services businesses wouldn't have because of how you're accounting and tracking for uh, commissions and premium payments. So definitely I agree. Find, find a bookkeeper, whether it's internal or, or you're outsourcing it, who's familiar with insurance agencies. So that's a, that's a huge thing. I, I, um, that I think we need to point out. And then two, yeah, agency build stuff. I have a deal right now that um, that's one of the biggest hurdles we're having is that they really? just did not track the, mm -hmm. the seller. My client's the buyer. The seller did not track their agency build uh, commissions and premiums like hardly at all. So there's these huge losses on the company's books that we're trying to kind of untangle like yeah who 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 actually owes the money to the agency right. <laughs> um who, where are the lie where are the liabilities kind of like who do i owe who who yep. who has a policy that has not been paid by us as as a, a potential e and o claims like it is man it is it is yeah so it's, it's so that's been world yeah so so particularly if your agency is um got agency build uh premiums and commission yeah definitely keep that clean that's yeah. so kudos to you for for making that a priority because that can be a nightmare um, once you have clean books you can actually get a really good valuation you can hire somebody to sit down with you um, and kind of go over what the industry standard is at that moment and be able to give you a really good snapshot a good picture of what can you expect as a seller what's what's a good range both both on a multiple of gross commission or on your EBITDA um, and spending some time with somebody who can really walk you through uh, what the value of your company is is invaluable because yeah. then you you go to market better informed when somebody just shows up at your door and says I'll give you a million dollars or 10 million dollars whatever it might be sometimes we get blinded by the dollar signs um, not recognizing that maybe our company's worth more. Yeah. Um, There's nothing worse than going into any situation where you don't know what you don't know. Right. Right. I'm, I'm going to have a meeting um, tomorrow with uh, a particular person in the investment space in an area that's a little bit cloudy to me. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was reach out to a friend of mine, another advisor who works, who, who kind of plays in that space. That's her space. And I said, Hey, I need to know what I don't know. Like, I don't need to know everything. But I just need to understand what I don't know. So when I walk into that meeting, um, you know, I, I'm okay not knowing something. I'm perfectly fine. Like I, I, in fact, I think that's a strength sometimes when you when you're able to say like I don't know everything. I'm okay with that. But I, I can learn mm -hmm. things. But man, when you don't know what you don't know, man, you walk you find yourself in situations that are uncomfortable very fast. Absolutely. So Absolutely. The last thing you would do is sit down with a, a buyer or a seller, or or in this case, a, a buyer, and not be prepared. Um, with something that you should have known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the better prepared you can be, the, the better the outcome, just uh, mentally, emotionally, and, the, and then the final deal result. Everything will just be better. Yeah. So. Okay, cool. Um, so 
so we've we've prepared our company where we've made sure our ownership structured we've done we've got our management team set up so that our buyers understand there's going to be long-term growth still even when we're not involved we've got our advisory team who's been helping prepare us we've got really clean books we've used our clean books now to get a good idea of what our valuation is uh, what we can expect at market the next thing is to make sure that just from a legal standpoint our company's clean that, that we have we've done we're doing everything we need to do and our buyers won't have to worry about some sort of a lawsuit cropping up later on that we caused because we just weren't in compliance you mean, can you give me um, an example of something yeah so in the insurance space what do your contracts say with your carriers that's a huge thing okay. so legally can you transfer your assets or your company if you want to do an equity deal um and have your buyer take over your carrier appointments in this hard market where carrier appointments are becoming so scarce new carrier appointments uh that can that can kill deals you might mm -hmm. want to sell to a competitor or a friendly competitor somebody that you know not one of the big aggregators um and are they going to or even a key employee maybe you have a key producer yeah. who wants to take over are they going to be able to do that uh, and get those carrier appointments. So you need to start having conversations with the carriers up front. I want to think about selling. You got to look at your carrier contracts. Most of them say the carrier has the right to cancel the appointment upon sale. And I've had situations where just giving the carrier notice, the carrier wow. was like, oh, we're going to, like, they, they sent notice, hey, we wow. inked a deal. We've got a purchase agreement. We want to transfer the appointments over to this key producer who had been working for the agency for five years. And the carrier said, no, we're canceling all your contracts. We're mailing notices to all your insureds. So oh, knowing that, I, yeah, right? So now you're oh, scrambling sucks. scrambling to place, uh, yeah. contact clients and and place uh, place these people with a new carrier if you can. That that speaks to... That speaks to um make sure you have really good carrier relationships especially mm -hmm. with with your the reps i know sometimes we love to to hate on reps um but man maintain really good relationships because you can prevent some of that stuff right i mean if if, if oh, yeah. you don't like your rep and they don't like you um like you it, said in this market that's not a good thing but if you yep. have good relationships good relationships can go a long way that maybe that might be the second biggest return on investment number one is on bookkeeping or or, or you know good good financial records the second one is investing in good relationships with with your vendors and your uh, uh your reps yeah that's really kind of like this unspoken but key i think an essential piece um as part of this transition transition in your company is having those good relationships i had a client where the carrier took his client he he's in a kind of a niche area of insurance and there's only a handful of other agencies in the country that compete with him so not even like an agency in the neighborhood this is in a completely different state and he couldn't get an appointment through this carrier to sell a certain line of insurance he sold insurance line a but he couldn't get b because b had already been given exclusively to somebody in the midwest well carrier took all of my client's contact information all of his customers and then gave it to agency that was doing lines B so they could cross sell. Well, agency that got line that was selling lines B started immediately contacting my client's customers to okay. sell them line A, try to steal that business from him. And the, one, the only reason he knew was because one of his customers who he had a long-term relationship with called him and said, hey, I'm I've got like five calls today from this other agency over in the Midwest. You know, what, what's going on? And so we contacted the carrier and it was really that rep relationship because the carrier under their contracts was allowed to do it. They were allowed to share the information, but because of that rep um, relationship that he had, the carrier was willing to tell the other agency to cease and desist. And that was really the only way to get it resolved without having to go through some very costly litigation. So I, wow. I agree with you hundred percent. Those rep relationships are key. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Um, so one of the things I see a lot too is sometimes we like to incentivize employees by 
sharing revenue with them, right? Producers get a split of their commission and we'll enter into these agreements where mm. whether we mean to or not, we've effectively given them ownership of their client relationships. So when I go to sell my book of business, am I actually selling something I own or am I now trying to sell something that 50% is owned by one of my employees? And what happens if that employee leaves in a year? So yeah. we want to make sure our, our contracts around our revenue base are we own them 100%. We can share revenue and bonus commission, but we want to make sure those contracts say that we own them. We have the right to transfer yeah. them to somebody else. We don't want to give our employees a right of first refusal to buy their books because if we have a buyer come to the table, well, now our employees have the right to, to take a piece of their book if they would like to. Um, that, that, that's a really good point. I've been having a couple conversations around that exact topic. Um I think it's a noble thing that we do as agency owners. Like we, we go hire a producer and we're like, Hey, yeah, come, come work with us. You know, we're going to pay you well, we're going to split commissions and yeah, you can have some ownership in your book of business, right? Mm -hmm. It's noble. It's like, yeah, that's kind of cool. And then on its surface, it sounds great, but, but you're right. Like in a sales situation, if all of a sudden I got a producer, let's say they make up a third of, of our business on the books and I go to sell, can I, how do I, do I sell, can I include their book in the purchase of mine? So sometimes it may be better if you want to give someone ownership, it may be better to do that phantom deal that we talked about yep. earlier where, hey, like you don't have ownership in your in your book. Then you're going to have ownership, a smaller amount in the entire book or some, some, form of, mm -hmm. some form of ownership type privilege in the entire book. And I think from a culture standpoint, man, what does that do? from that producer standpoint to now look at the entire business, have ownership in the entire business to, to want to see the entire business succeed, as opposed mm -hmm. to saying, man, I'm just focused on my book. I don't care about my other producers or what's going on there. I just want to build what I own or what I have ownership in. So I think that point from a sales standpoint, but also from a culture standpoint can be a huge point of, um, uh, you know, a huge point to focus on in terms of how we, how we structure our producer agreements. And this is something that, I was having a conversation with Carrie Wallace about this recently. And I was one of those noble people like, yeah, I'm going to give him ownership in his book. And she's like, don't do that. It's the worst thing you can do. I'm like, why, Carrie? Come on. <laughs> yep. I mean, we, I see it all the time, unfortunately. And it's, we, we, to some extent, we have it in the legal community as well. You develop this book of business, you have the client relationships. So you can leave and people will give you money to leave where you're at and come join them and bring your revenue stream with you. So it can be very tempting yeah. for, for uh, producers to jump ship. I had a, a client recently who needed to renegotiate a producer agreement with his key producer. The key producer rejected it and left and they didn't have any contracts in place preventing him from soliciting that customer base. And then Several weeks later, the client finds out that this producer has been negotiating for months with this other agency that he was going to open up a shop for them in that area. So just having good contracts with your producers and employees is super important so that the you understand what your rights are. They understand what their rights are, but you understand yeah. you have control over your clientele. So let, let's kind of sit on this, this spot really quick. You talk about solicitation kind of in the world we live in now with non-competes and, and whatnot. Break down really quickly for us the difference between non-solicitation and a non-compete and a non-piracy and how kind of those three interact and, and what 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 a good way to write write that provision into contracts is or agreements is. Okay, so non-competes are exactly what they sound like. You're not allowed to show up and compete with your former employer uh, or if you're a seller, you'll be expected to sign a non-compete with your buyer. Uh, the most states and now the federal government are moving to a system that disfavors non-compete agreements because the idea is we want people to be able to work. We think it's good for the economy and it's good for the customer to be able to have options. Okay. So non-competes are, uh, particularly now with the new F FTC rules, are, are no longer legal, except in some very limited situations. One of those is protecting goodwill. So if you sell your business, some of that uh, sales price will be allocated to the goodwill associated with your name and with the name of your company. And to protect that, the buyer is able to get a non-compete from you as the seller. That's going to prevent you from not only working in that space, 
but also helping other people's work work in that space. And you typically try to narrow it by geographic area where the business is 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 doing business. Um, that's very different from a non solicitation. Now, non solicitation agreements can be overly broad and rise to the level of a non compete, so they need to be properly structured. But the concept there is that by virtue of you working with our company, you have gained access to our trade secrets, to our customer lists, to our pricing methodologies, whatever it might be for your particular industry. There's things you do that are a little bit different than your competitors, and that's what makes you successful in your space. And part of that is your customer list. So uh, it's okay to say, hey, you're not allowed to use that confidential information uh, to promote a competing business against us. So you had access to that only by virtue of the fact that we brought you in, we trained you, we helped you build your practice. Um, so non-solicitations are, are totally okay as long as they're properly structured and don't uh, kind of go over into that non-compete space. And typically you want to make it so that they can't compete, they can't solicit your customers and your current employees. We can't stop them from soliciting somebody that's quit and kind of gone out on their own, on their own accord. Mm -hmm. But the idea is you have this talent pool, you cultivated this talent pool, you train this talent pool just because they work for you. Uh, your former employee shouldn't be able to come and take your really good key CSR or, or other key employees that you have. Um, yeah. And if I'm a buyer and I'm looking at two agencies to buy, and two successful agencies, and this one has some good, strong non-solicitation language in their producer contracts, and this one doesn't mm -hmm. have any producer contracts. I'm going to be a little bit, uh, <clears throat> I still may buy this one, mm -hmm. but it might not rise to the same level of multiple as the other one that's got stronger agreements and stronger contracts. There's, there's some risk involved, yep. and I need to be rewarded for my risk. Absolutely. So your, yeah. buyers, are, your buyers are looking at, uh, again, can you demonstrate through your financials and your operations that the company is going to continue to have that upward growth stream yeah. uh, long-term over the next five to 10 years? And that's really going to drive that multiple. Um, you know, the, the other things, doing simple things too on the legal side can be good. You, you typically have to file annual reports with the states where you're located. You've got to do minutes. Even if you've got an LLC where the rules are a little bit more relaxed, mm -hmm. hold an annual meeting for your members and your managers and just document it. So that way you've got records that show, yeah, we encountered some issues. We we made some some business decisions. That That's even helpful for things like we decided not to make any distributions this year, so we have a bunch of cash sitting around. What are we going to use use it for? Um, particularly if you're a corporation and there's there's limits on how much accumulated earnings you can have sitting in the company that raises tax audit issues so mm -hmm. making sure you've got those minutes documenting why you're doing these things super important and very basic very simple and your buyers if they're sophisticated uh, they're going to want to see that stuff they're going to want you to produce those documents uh, so that they can review them and make sure you've been respecting the separate nature of your company um, another thing to think about on the legal side are what kind of consents do you need? We talked a little bit about carrier appointments, but mm -hmm. you have a landlord, your landlord's going to need to give consent. So when you're negotiating those leases and there's always going to be in a clause in there about assignment, being able to transfer that lease to somebody else, that's going to include the sale of a business and how much ownership interest can be transferred before you have to get their approval. Is there a cost associated with getting their approval? Typically they want some fee. I had a purchase or I had a lease agreement one time that said they were entitled to 25% of the purchase price. Yes. 25% of the purchase price was the fee <laughs> for selling the company and trying to get out of that lease. Now, thankfully, who uh, negotiated that? I have, <laughs> Who the knows, the, right? The business, they, the building owner had a really good attorney. He, absolutely. And and the and the client just signed it, not even thinking about it. And it, it was like a $15 million deal. It was a substantial purchase price that we were talking about. And finally, I got the, the landlord's attorney to realize there's no way a court was going to enforce that. But there was some risk there. <laughs> there was some legitimate risk yeah. that we, we, we could lose. I mean, he entered... 
two parties with equal bargaining power, um, the court will probably assume that that was a negotiated term that should be upheld. So there's risk there. So paying attention to those kinds of things, your SBA loans or whatever loan documents, there's almost always change of ownership provisions that uh, Wait, come put on. restrictions. We don't, like, we don't, as you're talking, I'm like, I'm feeling a little bit of shame here. Like, man, like, I read I read a lot of contracts I sign, but I don't read them all, man. Like there's some level of there's some level of like I can't probably change it. I can't change SBA language, so I'm not gonna read. Well, oh, yeah. I can't. You know, there there's some level of man. Gosh, I hope I'm doing business with people I trust. Maybe that's one of the things. Do business with people you trust. I don't know. Well, well, part of it's the having that advisory team. I, I get nobody wants to incur fees. Right, because that just eats into profits. Having that good advisory team that can be able to to do quick reviews of documents that they've seen a hundred times because the SBA forms, like you said, are almost always the same. Um, th that's key. I mean, you can always do it on your own. I, I know very intelligent business owners who could be attorneys, um, but just having that team is always helpful. Uh, but yeah, I can't tell you, you know, every now I can't and stress then, this enough. Every now and then I'll go and like fix like a faulty, uh, thing on my toilet where it flushes but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean i should be a plumber right right and, and i think i think that's something i think especially the more entrepreneurial of us um, agency owners sometimes we think that we can do it on our own but it comes back to this idea of where am i where's my true value where am i compensated more am i compensated more to read and write my own contracts mm-hmm or my contract or or my is is my value in building my team and driving more revenue and let me pay david to write my mm -hmm. contracts let me pay let me pay terry to be my cfo let me hire out a bookkeeper right, right. Uh, is my value in trying to design my own retirement plan um, yeah, people can do it on their own, but is my true value and again building a team and driving revenue and let me let me hire somebody who knows who, who can maneuver, who can navigate that for me. I think that's what, when you start looking at professionals, yeah, there's some stuff you can do. You don't need to hire a CPA. You can buy your own taxes. You could. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could. You, you don't need to hire a financial advisor. You can do it all on your own. You could. But where are you, where are you making most of your money? Exactly. Exactly. Um, your, your emotional and physical energy, mental energy, should be spent on doing the thing that you do best. Um I get, I get. There's budget constraints, right? We got, we yeah. all have to live within a budget. I, I understand that, and sometimes it's not feasible mm -hmm. to to have a professional step in and handle every aspect of your business. But it's almost always more cost effective, mm -hmm. um, because just, because yeah. it's what they do all the time, so they can do it faster, typically, and better than how I could do it. And there's some element of they carry the the warranty, the liability, mm -hmm. right? Like if something goes wrong, I can go back to them. Yep. Um, whereas if I go download a contract from LegalZoom.com for a producer agreement, I just really know what, there's no recourse. There's no one I can go back to. Um, I don't want to go, I don't want to, I want to be respectful of your, your time here. Uh, I don't know if you covered everything that you wanted to cover, but there's something you just said that that made me think of maybe one of the more important things that you need to do to prepare to sell. So before I want to make sure that you, you, you've kind of covered some of your higher, your bigger points before I go there. Yeah, no, I think, I think those are the key. I mean, yeah. we, we, we could probably do a whole podcast we, on just we, what we legal go. requirements yeah. there are, but I, I think those are kind of the keys. That we're but talking guys, about. if you want to do a podcast on legal retirements, I wouldn't bore you with that. Just go hire <laughs> an attorney, let them deal with the legal stuff. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, one thing you just said that, that I think is huge. In it's it's kind of unsaid in too many spaces. You talk about the emotional, uh, mm -hmm. the emotions involved. I think probably one of the things that gets in the way of us selling is the emotions. Mm -hmm. Is if we're not emotional ready, emotionally ready to sell the business that we, I mean, because like our businesses, they're like a family member. It's like a part of our family. It's like a child. And like, mm -hmm. I spent 10, 15, 20, 30 years pouring my heart and soul into this, building relationships with with my clients, building relationships with other people in the industry. And then all of a sudden I'm going to sign a contract and all that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. Am I emotionally ready for that? That might be with the biggest obstacle. And hiring a bookkeeper is easy. Getting your contracts written up. It's fairly simple, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
building relationships with your vendors, uh, challenging, but you know, you could do that. Like becoming emotionally ready. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge. That's hard. It is. It's, and your business is oftentimes um, such a key part of your identity. I mean, we all have different mm -hmm. aspects of who we are, right? I'm, I'm yeah. Dave, I'm a lawyer, I'm a father, husband, I like to surf, be outdoors. But so much of what I do during the day involves my company and my employees, my clients. And so the vast majority of people that know me know me as Dave, the attorney, and our relationships are based around uh, the trust that they have because of that knowledge that I bring to the table. Yeah. And just being ready to kind of let that go is can, can be hard. Um, yeah. This because is, it's almost like losing a, a part of yourself in a way and, and well, your standing you in the community. Yeah, you said it best. The business, the business is a key part of our identity. Man, that that's something that's hard to to walk away from. Shoot, yeah. Dave, this was a great. Like I've got like pages of notes here. Um, you know, I love to selfishly invite podcast guests that are talking about things that are of high interest to me. This is definitely something that's uh, interesting to me as a as a as an agency owner, but also interesting to me as uh, as a financial planner who works with agency owners. So it allows me to to help kind of nudge them and push them along in some of these areas, especially when they tell me, Hey, yeah, I want to sell in five years. I want to sell in 10 years. What, what do we need to be doing? Well, you need to, you need to be building your, your team of advisors. You need to be making sure you're doing X, Y, and Z. So this was, mm -hmm. and this was, this was great. I appreciate your time. And could you kind of leave us if, if, and we'll also put this in the show notes, if someone wants to get in touch with you or reach out to you, where's the best place to find you? Oh, um, so PFS Law, P is in Paul, F is in Frank, S is in Sam, actually stands for Professional Financial Solutions. So PFS Law. You can find me online at pfsonline.com. Um, and so you'll, you'll see the service offerings of the company as a whole. So PFS Law is affiliated with the larger PFS Global uh, Managed Services Group. So yeah. they, uh, they nice. offer a lot of different services in addition to legal. But yeah happy to chat with anybody so always awesome. look forward to meeting people in other places appreciate you man take care all right thank you so much